Welcome to the Ask Jordan Podcast, answering your questions about selling on Amazon. Now, the award-winning Amazon merchant and best-selling author from Long Island, New York, here's your host, Jordan Malik. Hello, Amazon sellers. My name is Jordan Malik. This is the Ask Jordan Podcast, 97th episode. I'm your host. Thanks so much for making me part of your day. If you're listening for the first time, welcome. This is the podcast where we only answer your questions about selling on Amazon. Now, every episode, we answer a different question from you, the listener, about selling on Amazon. If you miss an episode, that's all right. Head over to askjordan.net. Askjordan.net. We've got our uh, recent episodes there, and there's a link to our archived episodes. I mean, if you haven't already, please look for the link to leave a review. You'll see that after uh, every episode, a link to uh, leave a review on iTunes. Just head over to iTunes and do a search for Ask Jordan, and uh, please leave a review there. I could use some more reviews. I think I've got 24 at this time. And uh, I hope you're doing well. I hope your sales are going great, uh, and I hope you're having success on Amazon. If you have submitted a question to me in the past... Uh, by the way, and I haven't answered it. You think I haven't answered it? Please send me an email, jordanmalik at gmail.com, J O R D A N M A L I K at gmail.com, or head over to askjordan.net, look for the small envelope icon near the upper right hand corner. Send me an email uh, if you think I've blown you off. I certainly don't want to leave anybody hanging, and it's impossible for me to get to all the questions. Some questions that I'm answering now are three, four months old. So I apologize for that. You know, it costs money and time to do these episodes. I do love doing them, but it's impossible for me to do it every day. If I did it every day, I'd be probably completely caught up with the questions, but I do the best that I can. If you want to hear your voice on an episode and get seven of my best-selling eBooks, hundred percent free, I'm going to tell you how to do that after we answer today's question. Today's question is from Andrew. Go ahead, Andrew. Hi, Jordan. My name is Andrew, and I listen to your podcast. been listening for a while. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I am brand spanking new at Amazon. They actually haven't even uh, made my first sale, learning the ropes, t- taking some courses, learning from you, so on and so forth. My question is, I recognize now that there's a number of different ways to go about this business between uh, retail arbitrage and, and thrifting and, and such. My question is, can you give kind of a basic overview of the various methods to go about Amazon FBA or just selling on Amazon in general and what you suggest for the new person to get started, kind of the let path of least resistance or whatever it is that you suggest. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Look forward to hearing your answer. Bye-bye. Andrew, great question. Kind of already answered this in the previous episodes, but I guess it's worth repeating. That's why I picked your question. Uh, The path of least resistance. I could answer that in so many ways. First, let me tell you what you shouldn't do. And Andrew, uh, again, you submitted this question three, four months ago. You're probably farther along than 95% of the other sellers out there at this point. But one thing not to do is a good number of sellers starting out on Amazon try to go big right away when they're sourcing. And I think your questions, Andrew, is, is revolves around so- how, how and what should you source for products to, to sell on Amazon or products to resell on Amazon. A lot of sellers get into this and they want to go big right away. They get a $5,000 loan or they have a $10,000 credit limit on their bank card. And their thinking goes like this. If they buy $5,000 worth of inventory and they are able to make a 50% net profit margin on that, then their net profit will be $2,500. And they'll pay back their $5,000 loan or $5,000 credit card or $5,000 in debt or whatever, and they'll have enough money left over to buy more inventory and they'll reinvest, et cetera. I think the worst thing that you can do, no matter what type of sourcing you do, whether it's retail arbitrage, online arbitrage, wholesale, private label, used products, buying books in bulk, used or new, the worst thing that you can do is go big right away. Now, for me, who I'm I'm Mr. Frugal, going big right away for somebody like me is like $1,000 and up. But in reality, going big for somebody where they're putting a lot of risk first is probably, you know, $2,500, $3,000, $5,000, $10,000 and up. Worst thing you can do. One of the lessons in that is talked about the startup bros. I'm a part business partner of theirs. And if you do a search for startup bros and Malik on YouTube, you'll see some of our recent video presentations where we go through starting sourcing and importing products from China 
and they stay one of the things they say the worst thing you can do is worst mistakes of people that lose money are the people that go big right away the people that lose money and quit go try to go big right away and their thinking is that if they can buy a quantity 1000 of a you know three dollar blue tchotchke that's three thousand dollars and nobody does any testing the people that fail they don't do that they don't test the product first they don't research it they just automatically think they've seen a product selling on amazon they can go out and find it at a fraction of the cost it, there's a, it's there's more to it and testing getting samples first for instance if you're importing getting samples and testing those samples is ju- just one of the several critical points in the process before you start ramping up to go big and those are the parts that a lot of people just skip. So the path of least resistance, I would tell you, is don't go big right away. Now, that's not very tangible, I understand. So if I was doing it all over again and I wanted the path of re- least resistance, I'd do the same thing that, by golly, I did, you know, six, seven years ago when I started. Go when I started, when I got fired from my real job, my quote unquote real job working as an ad ex- executive at the biggest ad agency in the world in New York City. I got fired, and then I started ramping up my Amazon business. I dealt only in used books because that's really the only thing that people were selling five or six years ago. Third-party merchants were selling used media, used VHS tapes, used CDs, used DVDs, used books, primarily used books. The reason why I call that the path of le- a path of least resistance, and that somebody could argue this, they'll say, no, the, the path of least resistance is to do retail arbitrage. The path of least resistance is to do thrift stores. The path of least resistance is to buy goods at yard sales and Path of least, re- least resistance is to do online arbitrage. So there's pros and cons to each. The reason why I say used books is because the, it is a product that is relatively easy to find. Other sellers would argue with me and say they've given up on used books. I disagree. Relatively easy to find if you do a little use a little elbow grease. And the profit margins are tremendous because the product itself is 99 out of 100 times considered a throwaway by whoever's getting rid of it, whether it's the person having the yard sale or the used bookstore, uh, excuse me, or the library book rack. It's almost a throwaway. I don't think people understand the intrinsic value of many books that are out there. I'm not talking about penny books or romance novels or whatever. Textbooks are a category. There's other also equally profitable categories, but there's uh, so much profit potential and so much untapped out there. If you take a look at the competitive landscape right now, of all the sellers selling used books on Amazon and Abe books and eBay and half.com or pick your top 20 used book websites. That's probably, of all the inventory that's out there that's profitable, that's probably 1% of the inventory that's out there. Out there, I mean, in your neighborhood, on Craigslist, for the asking, uh, at the yard sale, at the thrift store, at the library, in the hospital, when they have their semi-annual book sale. There, I mean, you know, go to, if you need ideas, go to jordanmalik.com slash blog slash resources, see there should be a section in there about used books or, or finding books for sale. It's also a product that is not going to be, it has a very low return rate, right? People don't return a lot of books. They do with electronics or gadgets or toys because something breaks or somebody has buyer remorse or whatever. Uh, used books don't. So that is the path of least resistance. You could also argue, Andrew, that, by the way, Andrew, before I continue, if you want a great free book, on getting started selling used media, including used books. Media is called CDs, DVDs, et cetera. Go to sell FBA, the word sell, and the letters F is in fulfillment, B is in buy, A is in Amazon, sellfba.com slash JM, all lowercase, J is in Jordan, M is in Malik, sellfba.com slash JM. And I'll have all these links for you at uh, the show notes on askjordan.net, episode 97. Look for episode 97 to see the links to what I'm talking about. Path of least resistance could, somebody could also argue successfully, path of least resistance is diversifying. So you should not only be looking for used books in your local area, you should also be doing retail arbitrage, going into stores, retail stores, scouring their clearance racks with a barcode scanner from, say, Profit Bandit, and finding local, and this is the same thing I do today, is finding uh, local stores that have items on clearance that may be hot sellers or sell very well on Amazon. 
The other path of least resistance or, or a path of least, least resistance when you're diversifying and finding other channels is online arbitrage, although the competition for that's increased quite dramatically. If you're going to be successful in online arbitrage today, you have to uh, expect some of the products that you buy, some or many of the products that you buy may take six to nine months to sell at a healthy profit margin because other people are just jumping on the same products, right? One may argue the last path of least resistance is wholesale because sourcing wholesale or sourcing a private label has gotten a lot easier today than it was, say, a year and a half, two years ago. The pros of sourcing private label is that you can do one to five products, one to five different products. When you master the concept of researching the right product to sell, you could sell just, you could have just one or two or three or four or five different products. And that can be times, you know, the quantities are thousands, but that can be, you're only managing those five products and it simple, it can simplify things in a way. It also can put you at high risk. I know people that are selling on Amazon that had their accounts closed. There's, there's, it, it's August, early August, and I'm recording this. There has been a spike in Amazon account suspensions. And the rumor, which I think is verifiable, is that Amazon has a software program that kind of scours everybody's listings, looks for red flags. And this that software program has been over eager in flagging people's accounts to close. And there's a whole appeal process for that. If you go to my blog, honestonlineselling.com and do a search for account suspension, I think I have an article there about a service provider uh, that that helps with that, or just you know one of your Facebook groups that you belong to that supports other Amazon sellers. There's a number of free Facebook groups, a forum of other Amazon sellers helping other Amazon sellers, and one of those folks might be able to help you out with your account suspension. I was saying doing private label is great, right? The private label has a lot of promise and making a lot of people very rich. Not rich, but you know, some people rich, but it's making a lot of people nice six digit annual streams of profits, which is, is great, but it can come with its risks too. When you're all your money's tied up in one product and that product hap- you happen to get an account suspension from Amazon. And many of these account suspensions can be reversed, it, particularly if you've done nothing wrong. Um, and I don't want to scare anybody off because these things are rare, but they do happen. But if you have all your money and you're doing one to five products and your account gets shut down for whatever reason, or that product, you're banned from selling that particular product. You have one product on Amazon and you're barred from selling that because there's an issue with a safety issue or something that they think may exist or not. You have the the prospect of all your revenue being tied up. So when you diversify path of least resistance, right? When you diversify among, say, books, the risks of you getting your account shut down are pretty low. They get it. If you were doing all used books, I think the account your chance of your account being shut down is pretty low, uh, much lower than say if you were just specializing on one specific product, one SKU, right? So Andrew, I hope that answers your question. But no, if I was starting, somebody asked the same, somebody asked recently the same question, but it's a phrase different way. Jordan, if you were doing it all over again, what would you do? My answer would be in used books because there's a lot of money in it. Many sellers won't touch used books because it's not convenient. It's not sexy. It's not convenient. It's not sexy in that you can't, You can't be the star of a cocktail party and say that you're selling brand new selfie sticks from China that you're importing for $3 a piece and selling for 12. You can't say that at a party when you're selling used books. It's very unflattering sounding, doesn't it? Oh, I'm a used book businessman, you know, which I don't care about, but I can understand why sellers shy away from that because it doesn't sound sexy, right? And it also requires some elbow grease when you're dealing in a significant volume of used books. Although you can do very well at you know fifty selling fifty used books a week, that's considered a volume to some, and some people don't want to get their hands dirty. They consider it boring, or they consider it beneath them. I don't. To me, it's just the closest thing to printing money. So, Andrew, I hope that answers your question. Andrew, you get all seven of my eBooks about selling on Amazon, and eBay. Andrew, just head over to AskJordan.net, click on the small envelope icon near the upper right, uh, right-hand corner of the page to send me an email so I know where to send your eBooks to. And if you, the listener, Want to submit a question to the podcast and have a chance to win all my best-selling ebooks like Andrew Call, 516-619-ONLINE with your question. That's 516-619-6654 or go to AskJordan.net and scroll down. Look for the direction of submitting your question. Hey, thanks for listening. This has been the Ask Jordan Podcast. We'll see you again in our next episode.